Dem women, we are so happy to be able to honor Marion Shapiro, who's been on the board. I'll let Laura talk more about this, but for a long time. Thank you, Claudette. Laura Capps, our supervisor. Hello. I have the honor of introducing our congressman, but first I'm going to just speak to why we all love Marion at Democratic Women. I'm the vice president of Democratic Women along with Claudette. And um, as Claudette just talked about, joy. And when I think about Marion and her role in Democratic Women, in, in, in addition to the content, the fact, you just look at her, and you see her at all these events and that twinkle in her eye. She is, as I heard uh, our Vice President say the other night, she is a joyful warrior. She is a joyful warrior. She's always there with that joy, keeping us going when things have been tough. And now things we have an opportunity and we're feeling the spirit. But when we didn't, she's still joyful, right? It really means a lot. We are so pleased that our congressman um, has the proclivity of choosing Democratic women as his women of the year. No surprise. He's been such a supporter, advocate, women's rights. And what better time could you imagine? You have a good, keen sense of timing to give the Congressional Women of the Year Award to Marion Shapiro at a time when our rights, when our reproductive health so many things are literally on the ballot. They're on the front lines. And you had the foresight to award somebody who's been doing it through thick and thin. So with that, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you to our congressman for bestowing this award so that we could all enjoy in this joy and keep it going. Congressman Salih Carvajal. It's a real honor for me to be here. As many of you know, every year, I believe congressional districts throughout the entire country have a process by which they have a nomination process for amazing women that have distinguished themselves in, in service to the community to improve our way of life, to improve our country and our communities that we live in. And this year, for the 24th Congressional District, we got 100 nominations. And six of them rose to the top. And one of those amazing women who I am honored to recognize today is Marion Shapiro. The recognition comes in three ways. One is the congressional record. As former Congresswoman Lois Capps knows, it's, it's an official record statement that is put into the congressional record to be in the archives of the United States Capitol and Congress in perpetuity. So if you were to look up Marion Shapiro in the future, her name should pop up, and her nomination statement today as a congressional record uh, will be there. So I want to read that because I think it says a lot about Marion's accomplishments over her many years in, of service, and the nominee was Suz Suzanne Cohen. In addition to the certificate and the congressional record, I'm going to give Marion a little pin so she can wear so that on her lapel, so that when she goes around in her service, people are gonna say, what is that? And she gets to tell them why, how she got that award. Marion Shapiro grew up in Berkeley and first arrived in the district in 1960 as a UCSB freshman. I knew you were special, that's my alma mater as well. She returned in 1968 when her husband was in a doctoral program at UCSB. Her husband's job took them to a small university town in rural Kansas where Marion raised her two kids while advocating for women, women's reproductive rights and LGBTQ rights. She fought against hatred and led the way in human rights efforts. In 1980, she traveled from Kansas to DC as a delegate to the National League of Women Voters Conference. In her televised meeting with President Jimmy Carter, she spoke on behalf of the Floridian delegation asking President Carter to address the immigration crisis in Florida. A woman of many talents, she lobbied legislators while singing and playing the guitar at many women's movement events. Marion designed and led a number of workshops in conservative towns for parents and daughters and parents and sons, teaching them how to talk about puberty, dating, emotional management, and consent. In retirement, if she can actually say she's been in retirement, 
The Shapiros were thrilled to return to Goleta, where Marion taught for 11 years at Santa Barbara City College. She served on several boards, including Democratic Women of Santa Barbara County, as well as a Democratic Service Club, and always volunteered to elect candidates for public office. One of her proudest accomplishments has been organizing her big list of individuals who share her views on caring for the planet and human rights, and who respond to her Shapiro Action Alerts. The group has grown to include 650 recipients who appreciate her calls to action and her notices of important events to protest demonstrations they may not know about. At 81 years old, Marion enjoys making pottery and has become an excellent photographer who we all have been at the, at the front of her lens. She adores her children and relatives you will often see Marion lending her photography skills to events for political candidates and nonprofits alike. I am honored to recognize Marion Shapiro for her exemplary advocacy. In honoring Marion Shapiro's remarkable achievements, we celebrate her enduring legacy of service, which continues to uplift and inspire lives in the 24th Congressional District and beyond. And with that, I want to present you this congressional record. Thank you, Deanna. So this is the congressional record. We framed it for you so you could put it up somewhere special in your home or your office. And that's not all. We have this congressional certificate of recognition to Marion Shapiro in recognition of being selected as the 2024 Congressional Woman of the Year. This little pin, it's a little congressional pin, it's like a mini congressional pin. You could probably get on the floor, they probably would recognize you, just let you in, right Lois? Just a little bit smaller. But this is something that I hope you wear often, and so that people can ask you and you could let them know why you have that pin. And with that, let me just say how honored I am to bestow this honor on Marion. Um, she certainly exemplifies the best of our community somebody who's been a trailblazer, who continues to lead, and in service of making our community better, and especially those who haven't always had all the rights that they deserve. Women, minorities, people of color, the disenfranchised, and you have been there. Congratulations. And with that, I'll turn it over to her. Thank you to all her friends, colleagues, family that are here um, in celebrating you. Thank you, Salute, so much. Thank you, Salute, so much for choosing me as one of your six women. I feel very honored that Suzanne suggested me and that you chose me, especially in this group of women who are so politically active. You're all just doing a terrific job. Since you all knew me, only as an old lady who took up photography and ceramics in retirement, I'd like to share a little bit about my life before I was an old lady. Um, only I think two people here know me when I was, knew me when I was young. Sally Hamilton. Sally and I were here as freshmen in UCSB. We lived in the dorm. I knew you as beautiful. She was like Joan Baez. She looked yeah. like Joan Baez. She had this long hair. She always wore sandals, and she sang. She led us in spring sing. That's the thing that we used to do at UCSB, and she was our leader. And she had this big boyfriend that was about 6'5", and the two of them, he would lift her up. It was so cute. And the other person who knew me when I was younger was Sue Ehrlich. And Sue and I knew each other in 1968 when we both lived in married student housing, and I took care of her little three-year-old who was like a big brother to my Joel, who was two. My first lessons in political activism were when I was 10 years old, and I went door to door with my mom in the Bay Area handing out brochures for Adlai Stevenson for president. I know some of you younger people won't know who Adlai Stevenson is. I don't know who that is. <laughs> I also learned growing up what Donald Trump has never learned, 
that immigrants contribute greatly to our country and value this country tremendously, especially if they are refugees fleeing for their lives, as my parents were. My parents became politically active Democrats and never missed an election. Having grown up in Berkeley, it's an understatement to say that moving to rural Kansas for Marty's first teaching job was culture shock. The Attorney General of Kansas announced that the state would no longer provide birth control in their county health departments. And that gave me a cause to fight for and got into reproductive health care for, for women and men. And I did that for 31 years in Kansas. I was very close friends with Dr. George Tiller, who provided abortions in Wichita, and I think many of you know that he was shot in his church. And every time I saw him and hugged him, I would feel his bulletproof vest under his shirt. I'd already been an advocate for sex education. I used to take sex ed books to the PTA and show other parents. And this little town was very, very conservative. It was 70%. Russian, German, Catholics, which were not like any of my Catholic friends in California. Unlike here in California, where everybody and their uncle is a sex educator, there, <laughs> nobody was a sex educator. No Dr. Ruth on the radio, no Lonnie Barback on Phil Donahue shows. So they really needed me. And I started doing programs about puberty for mothers and daughters, and then later, for fathers and sons. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do them in schools, but I wasn't allowed in schools. So I would do them. I would get a church, a minister who was supporting of Planned Parenthood, and I would say, can we do a parent program in your church? The mothers told me when, when they came to the mother-daughter program, they couldn't talk to their kids about puberty, puberty because it was too embarrassing to say period. The fourth, the fourth graders, of course, grew up, and when they were in high school, sometimes these moms would call me and say, I was in your mother-daughter class, but my daughter is now, I think, getting close to having sex. Well, I used to tell the parent programs, parents are about two years behind where their kids are. And sure enough, <laughs> I'll never forget one week. One week, I had three, parent, three moms call me, can I bring my daughter for you to talk about birth control to her? The reason they wanted me to talk about it is because they didn't want to look like they were giving permission to have sex. So I always say, sure, bring her down, and then I try to have a few minutes with the daughter alone. One of the daughters had, had been coming to Planned Parenthood for birth control for two years. <laughs> One of the daughters had been treated for chlamydia. One of the daughters had had an abortion. We also did pr the programs for sons. And some of the dads, and some of the moms too, told me that they learned as much in the programs as the kids did, because they never had any education. I had one friend who was one of 17 kids. They were large families, because they didn't believe in birth control. Um, she, was in, she was one of 17 kids, about in the middle somewhere. And she bled for two days, and then she went to her mother, and she said, I think I've got some terrible disease. And her mother said, "You're." Big sister will be home in two days. She'll explain it to you. We started to do the boys, and the boys in fourth and fifth and sixth grade were not at all interested. So we did boys in seventh grade. And I did a two-part program, a week apart. And the first one, neither the boys nor the fathers looked happy to be there. The second class, a week later, the boys came running in. And they were so happy to, to learn some more, because nobody wants to be in the dark. So remember, you know, this is not liberal California. They weren't used to having sex ed programs. This was something rather unusual. One dad who took my class saw me a few months later, and he met me on the street, and he said, Marion, I just want to thank you for teaching us about doing self-testicular exam, like self-breast exam. He said, I, I went home, and I did the exam, and I found a lump, and I got to the doctor. I was very grateful for two dads who shared their own puberty experiences, which is much better than hearing about it from me. One of the dads was a high school counselor. Everybody knew him, and he shared that he had had gynecomastia, which is a breast swelling that happens in about 65% of boys. He couldn't even have a shirt touching his chest without it hurting. The pain was one thing, but the worst thing was that he thought he was turning into a woman and he didn't know who to talk to. He could not tell anybody. So the boys learned that this is something that can happen, that it goes away, it's not, you're not turning into a woman, 
and it's okay to tell your parents or the doctor. The other dad who shared something, he was a banker, and he shared about his first wet dream that he was very scary. He woke up and thought he was having a heart attack. <laughs> and so the boys found out that wet dreams happen. They don't, they don't mean you're, you're a bad person, you're sinful, you have something to feel guilty about, they're normal. And I wish I had a counselor like you. <laughs> I learned a lot of things today that I didn't even know. Takes an activist to, to to bring this information into schools where they're trying to keep you out. The last thing that I that I want to share about the sex ed career in the Bible Belt was my work with LGBT kids. From the things that I'd written in the paper, everybody knew that I was a safe person that they could talk to me. And boys used to come, and they always thought that they were the only one who was gay, that nobody else was like them. It was before the internet where you could find out more about what's going on in the world. And I just would say to them, if you can just hold on for a couple of years until you can move out of this small town, go to college in Lawrence, in Kansas City, in Denver, you'll find a whole community of people just like you. That information actually literally saved some lives. I used to tell them that there were gay doctors, grocers, college professors that I know here in Hayes, Kansas, but they're not, they're not out. One high school kid that I, I just tell you about one, one kid, he was from a very prominent family, and he told his religious mom that he thought he was, might be gay, and she was very traumatized by that, and he told me he could never, ever tell his dad. So I got together, four parents of gay kids whose kids had grown up and they were comfortable enough to say, we love our kids, there's nothing wrong with them. And I was very lucky that one Catholic priest supported me and I got him to come and hold that mother's hand through the meeting. That son is now a physician, a psychiatrist, and he and his Asian husband are accepted by the whole family, including the father. So I have loved being an advocate for choice and all the values we, as Democrats, stand for. And thank you, Salud, for fighting for all those values, that the democratic values for health care, for protecting the environment, for creating jobs, reducing climate change. And thank you to our elected Democrats who are here. So thank you all, and thank you all you wonderful activist women. We are going to have a landslide election in November. Yeah.